Hey guys, Ron here, and I have never been more nervous to talk about Pokemon. You thought Gen 7 was divisive, well Let's Go split the community more than a dino upon evolution. Even after playing Let's Go, my opinion of it is the most mixed I've ever been about any Pokemon game. But that doesn't mean a whole lot, because I enjoyed every single Pokemon game I ever played, because I honestly play the games for the bonds I make with my Pokemon. And regardless of whatever gripes I'm going to mention, and there will be more than I usually have, this game, without a doubt, has allowed me to bond with the Pokemon on my team more than any other Pokemon game. So if that's why you love Pokemon, then yeah, buy these games! I'm glad I did, but the problem with Pokemon, or when you think about it, its strength really, is that you can love Pokemon for so many different reasons. The Pokemon themselves, the lore, the battling, the plot, when there is one, the world, the characters, the origins, the designs, the art, and even the music. Each Pokemon game excels in a different aspect. So this review isn't a recommendation to buy these games, because I don't know why you in particular play Pokemon. That being said, keep in mind that the following review is from the perspective of someone who really enjoyed the other Generation 7 games. Some may think those games held your hand too much, and they did, but I didn't see it as a trend of these games becoming more childish, because I can honestly say that the Alola games were the most challenging Pokemon games that I've ever played by far, with some of the most mature characterizations in the franchise. So I didn't take Pokemon Let's Go's lack of difficulty as an example of some kind of trend because Gen 7 was hard, so I'm not panicking at all. And conversely, easier does not equal less fun. There are a lot of changes in these games that seem to make things easier on the surface, but ultimately make the game more pleasant to play. But what are the things I love and what are the things I dislike? Let's actually begin the review, shall we? If I miss something, that's probably because it didn't really affect my experience for better or worse. And if I included it, then it would just be nitpicking. The first thing we gotta talk about is Kanto. While I do like Kanto just as much as the next guy, and I'm not even one of the few who gets annoyed by Game Freak catering to Kanto fans, but I do believe that Kanto is the least diverse region geographically. Compared to any other region, it's the most boring. It's hard to get too excited when every route is simply a grassy plain and every town, while super pretty, isn't too different from the last. And yes, that affected my enjoyment of the game. But its simplicity, especially in its story, is definitely charming and does make it unique compared to the Yolola region games. And I've played Kanto games less than most other super fans, so I was excited to go back to Kanto and even invited it, because I'm of the mindset that if they were going to experiment and make a transitional game with Pokemon Go mechanics, it should be set in Kanto. Before I played them, I was grateful that they didn't waste the Sinnoh remake on Let's Go titles, instead of making an actual remake along the lines of Heart Gold. But even after I played them and had a lot of fun, I still think that Kanto was the best choice. But in the end, it's still the version of Kanto with the least amount of content, considering Fire Red's Sevi Islands are pretty good. But let's start talking about the new things. The graphics in these games are also divisive. Some think it's vibrantly beautiful, and some think it's definitely not good enough for the Switch. Here's my opinion. These games are still Generation 7 games. I never wanted these games to look like how Generation 8 is going to look like. I don't want to be spoiled. All I was expecting was a high-res Gen 7.5 game, and that's what it is. That's why I think the style was genius. First, it's a game that's supposed to transition new fans into the franchise, but also longtime fans into Generation 8. It's already way better looking than Sun and Moon, and I love how Alola looks. It's like the jump from Generation 6 to 7. Also keep in mind that this cute art style is intentional. You can hate it, but you can't really say it's objectively bad. For example, look at the water. You see those triangles at the edges of the rocks? That's not there because Game Freak can't cook up something better. That's there for style and charm, and I like it. And regardless of my opinion on whether or not these games should be a tile-for-tile -tile recreation of Kanto, that's kind of what they're going for, so of course the layout of the roots might be a step back from the other Generation 7 games, which had more dynamically shaped grass patches. The models and textures themselves look great! The Pokémon look amazing in battle! Five times better than in Sun and Moon, even though they're technically the same models. I love the texture that the Pokémon have, they're not just solid colors, there's some discoloration on the skin and fur, and while the animations are basically the same as the previous games, they were already pretty good. Each Pokémon attacks with personality, but I do believe that the details behind the NPCs and especially the houses have gone a step backwards. Most of them look the same, say something that isn't interesting, and the inside of the houses are almost always identical, as opposed to Alola where half the NPCs look really different, say something that expands the world, and have extremely detailed houses. But let's talk about mechanics. These games changed the controls more than any other Pokemon game, and for the first two hours of my playthrough, it really felt like a completely different series in terms of how I played, because of all the new stuff added. Right when I opened up the game, I noticed how jerky the movement was whenever I went from standing to running, like it was missing a frame. But you get used to it, and your brain does tune it out once you start playing. Using one controller isn't bad, but in the end, it's more logical when you control the character's movements with one controller, and interact with the world using the other. And you can't really do that unless you're playing in handheld mode. But I gotta say, while it's perfectly 
perfectly fine playing on a big screen, and that's a big draw of this game, playing handheld makes it feel more intuitive and similar to a normal Pokemon game. So it's not really a point against it being docked, it's just cool to have the option to play Pokemon in both ways. The party controls are really nice too, but the box could be better. It would be much more organized if we had folders or multiple boxes like in the other games, but the game does control well. It's actually the most fast-paced Pokemon games in terms of running away from a Pokemon. But we can't talk about controls without talking about the number one mechanic in this game, and in the end, that's what made this game completely different. Not in terms of how faithful it was to the other games, but in regards to how I play Pokemon in general. I'm obviously talking about how Pokemon Go style catching replaces wild battles. Almost all of the things I dislike about this game, in the first few hours at least, stem from this change. But conversely, it's also what made the second half of the game amazing. But my experience may be super different from others, so listen to this. Since we're technically still talking about the controls, let me address that a lot of people were talking about how whenever they would throw the ball, there were times where it would just go in completely random directions. There are so many people who hate the motion controls, and I don't know what to say. I never had that problem. I believe I'm just throwing the balls in the correct way even when I'm throwing it to the side, which did take a few times to master. I mostly throw underhand, but more importantly, the whole point is to make sure your controller is in the direction of the screen before you press ready. That's it. I'm sorry it worked literally every time. Therefore, the actual catching was fun and way more immersive and dynamic than the old way of catching Pokemon, but that's not what my problem was. I've been playing Pokemon the same way for decades now, and this is more about me than the actual changes in the game. I'm used to only putting Pokemon I want to train and use on my team. If it's in my party, it's there because I want to journey the region with that Pokemon. But in this game, I basically have to have a full party right at the beginning of the game, so I was forced to play in a manner that I'm not usually comfortable with for the first two gyms. I didn't bond with the Pokemon on my team because I never really chose them, and when they leveled up it was super unsatisfying because they didn't do anything to earn experience. I just caught a Pokemon, and even when they battle, the experience points are so low, and what sucks even more is how the experience share is mandatory. That means that some Pokemon are getting over leveled even though in past games I could control that and maintain the challenge, so the first one fifth of the game grinding gave me anxiety because I had to worry about overleveling the Pokemon I like and then having to take them out of my team for a bit of time so they wouldn't get too powerful and make the battles too easy and boring. And barely seeing your Pokemon in battle until Viridian Forest is weird so there isn't that much bonding. For me, it's not fun having Pokemon in the party that I know I will abandon. But, and this is a big but, this all changed after I beat Misty and basically made up my mind about which Pokemon were going to stay on my team. And it was at this point in the game where you start having way more interesting battles and a lot of them. That's when my anxiety left and I began to enjoy this game five times more than before. I began bonding with my team and that's what this game excels at more than any other Pokemon game. You don't get to bond with your Pokemon in wild battle grinding sessions, don't take that out of context, but god do you bond with these Pokemon in the overworld. You know how almost everybody loves the following mechanic in Heart Gold and Soul Silver? Imagine the immersion you get from that times 20. The overworld Pokemon were perfectly done. Each one has a different personality and walk style. Some of them are rideable in the most fabulous of ways. There is peak immersion whenever you're, for example, about to face a strong Pokemon or trainer like the Elite Four, and you turn to your Pokemon and the game tells you that they're nervous or pumped. You feel these Pokemon are your partners in a way like never before, and even the wild Pokemon in the overworld were masterfully handled. They all spawn and move in their own little ways. Some will be more energetic like Zubat, which helps emulate the feeling and nuisance of wild encounters. It's way more fun to maneuver through Pokemon in the overworld than to constantly run away from Pokemon you encounter. The Pokemon world also finally feels like a Pokemon world. Encounters sometimes even feel random and exciting because they can spawn right in front of your face. The overworld is a highlight of the game. There's another reason Kanto was a good choice because it didn't overshadow these new mechanics. And once all six Pokemon on my team were finally party members, catching Pokemon was fun again. And having the ability to access all the Pokemon you caught from your bag was monumental. I could interact with the Pokemon I just caught even if it's just for a bit, because there were a lot of times where I caught a Pokemon and wanted to see how it looked like when it followed me. I'd have fun with them in the overworld and then put them back, having felt fulfilled. But the number one ability that having a mobile box allowed was having a secondary team. I had my main team that I would use basically 80% of the time, and whenever they were all at the level I wanted them to be, I would bring in my secondary team to battle whatever trainers I had left to battle before the next gym and bonded with them too. I never played a Pokemon game in which I took care of and loved 
two completely different sets of party members. I'm talking about 12 separate Pokemon that all felt like partners, so while the game was easy in my opinion, it gave me the chance and time to fall in love with double the amount of Pokemon I usually do, and that's where the new grinding system shined. Catching Pokemon is much more dynamic, exciting, engaging, and a faster way to grind, so at the end of the day, catching Pokemon was way more fun than battling wild Pokemon in order to quickly level up, but I definitely wish it was optional. And that goes for the XP share too. And I also can't wait for when trainer battle experience is valuable again. I've seen people complain about the difficulty yet still using their super powered over leveled partner Pokemon in every battle with their new powerful moves and while playing with a secondary player for more experience when catching Pokemon. Pokemon has always been a game in which you create your own level of challenge based on the Pokemon you use and how much you grind and at the end you can still do this in this game. That's also why I like how basic the move pools were in this game. My Pokemon weren't getting powerful moves until later on which made battling a bit more interesting. But it's not the same for for your partner Pokemon. That's why my Pikachu was part of my secondary team. I never really used it in battle unless I was facing a water or flying type, and I loved it. I still bonded with it more than any other Pokemon through all the features like playing and styling it. I feel like this feature is a demo for the Gen 8 version of Pokemon Refresh, and if it is, then it's amazing. I love how the partner Pokemon's tail wag is used as the dowsing machine. It's a super convenient way to find items, and the techniques were fine replacements for HMs. I guess since we talked about the starter, let's talk about all the notable characters. I'm not the kind of person to desire a jerk rival. I like rivals that I can respect, and I mean, I can respect Trace a bit, he's a nice dude, and not too annoying. His battles were easy, but they were basically copies of the battles with Blue, so in terms of challenge, they're nothing to complain about in comparison. But he's definitely not in my top 5 rivals or anything. I actually did love how he adopts the Cubone that is featured in the plot. And let me say, that cutscene with its mother was perfectly done. All the cutscenes were great and non-intrusive. I love how these games take place a bit after Red and Blue become champions. It's fun seeing Blue's character development. It makes total sense that he wouldn't be a complete jerk to us, yet it still feels like Blue. I love how he's part of the plot. Seeing a younger Mina is also cool. I love her design, and the gym leaders in general have more personality and are clearly celebrities in this game. Their roles make much more sense. Not to mention the Elite Four, like, like even Lorelai's Lapras is entertaining. This thing is so much personality. Team Rocket's antics felt a little bit more coherent and present. Gen 7 has done real good to Giovanni and Team Rocket's role. Catching legendaries feel much more active and satisfying. The time limit for knocking them out wasn't a bad idea at all, since I encountered them when I was lower in level. For example, Articuno knocked out all of my team before I thought of a different strategy, and Mewtwo is way harder because I gotta fight him with my weaker Pokemon before I can use a Master Ball. I couldn't do it actually. Coach Trainers were a nice touch. Nothing too crazy though, and Master Trainers are okay, but not too captivating. I find it preposterous that Master Trainers exist for non-evolved Pokemon too, and at such a high level. And yeah, the lack of abilities and held items aren't really a positive thing in this game, and they make it easier, but I can't really say it's something I was thinking about while playing. It only felt different when fighting poison types that usually have levitate. That's it really. But as I finished the game and started flying over the Kanto region with my Charizard, seeing the Pokemon in the tall grass below, I saw a glimpse of the franchise's future. How can I complain with such a view? I'm honestly scared that the overworld Pokemon won't be featured in Generation 8, because that's what made these games so immersive and worth my time. I'll talk about the music in a top 10 video that I'm planning to make for Kanto, so don't worry about that. It's obviously a positive opinion. But overall, I'll give this game an 8.5. It's not my favorite Pokemon game, like most Pokemon games seem to be during my initial playthrough, but it did have an aspect to it that I enjoyed more than any other game, and that was the Pokemon themselves. And that's the reason I play Pokemon in the first place, so it's a success. And if you thought this video was a success, leave a like and subscribe for more. Make sure to check the description for all the music I use, the t-shirts I made for you guys, and my Patreon where you can get cool rewards like seeing my videos days early. Make sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter because that's super important. And also, you know, watch the videos on screen right now, they're, they're pretty cool. I'll see you guys very soon.